Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our honors and lead presentations. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we have Dr. Madi Dogaru, uh, Dogaru, sorry. Dogaru, yay. <laughs> Uh, got it. At Honors College, um, and we also have uh, Dr. Stacy Malaret and Brandy Blue joining us um, tonight. So thank you all so much for joining us, and we will go ahead and get started with our uh, honors presentation. If you have any questions, we will take all the questions after both of our presentations tonight. Um, so we will moderate that at the end. So Madi. Okay, I will start sharing my screen. Um, I hope everybody sees it. <laughs> Is that okay? Looks good. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So um, one of the things that I always like to talk about is what is Honors College at UCF all about, number one? Number two, how is it different from other honors programs? Number three, to admit to myself and to anybody who researched honors colleges that they can be confusing. So I'm trying to focus on how honors college at UCF is working, what is it doing, what is it trying to, and how is it unique or different and what's special about it. And I always start with the vision because it's what motivates all of us in the Honors College and the university at large. What is the purpose? What we're trying to accomplish? And I'm not going to read every word out loud. I just want to make sure that everybody sees it because it's important. So <clears throat> there's, of course, more than three, but we try to wrap our presentation around three main pillars, so to speak. One of them is learning, of course, because you come to college to learn. And that's, of course, including curriculum, courses, what do we offer, what do we ask of you, um, how is it working? So we're going to focus a lot this, this evening on the University Honors Program, which is the course requirement type program at UCF. And the University Honors means that you typically start as a freshman. And I say typically because there are some very, very small exceptions from that. You start as a freshman and you start taking honors courses as they befit your interests, your requirements, your major requirements, and then you graduate with university honors. So that's as simple as that. And it, there's a lot of analogy with the, uh, with the high school in that way, where everybody has to take four years of English, but you can take them in different vanilla or chocolate flavor. Uh, at UCF, we have different types of uh, honors courses that we offer. A lot of them, the majority are actually honors versions, are uh, others, uh, honors, um, fee, you know, yeah, versions of existing courses at UCF. And we have lower division and upper division requirements. And the <clears throat> requirements spelled out here are generic. <clears throat> uh, lower division at UCF and in general in university language, it means courses that you take either as prerequisites for upper division or gen eds. Our, in general, honor students come with a lot of courses earned, credits earned from high school, so they don't need a lot of all these courses as, as uh, lower division, but they may still need prerequisites. We can talk a lot more about that, but right now I'm just trying to kind of encapsulate what honors is all about. You take honors courses as you move along. That's, that's the simplest definition of honors. Uh, there are two types of courses that are not quite the same for everybody, and they're not included or required of anybody's specific major, but it's just two. The rest are just courses that are listed, and you have, you have choices, a lot of choices, um, <clears throat> and we ask you to take a few from that list. How are honors courses different? 
This is a question that we get a lot. Brandy and I answer this question multiple times. Brandy is an IB graduate. Uh, and I, uh, we always get this, oh my God, is honors going to be IB 2.0? And she's no, nodding her head. Not the IB 2.0, no, no, I you. That's different. Uh, Brandy is a, as my colleague and my dear friend. And uh, she's uh, not just an honors graduate, uh, top of her class, two majors, National Merit Scholar. And she can, she's the best proof that uh, IB and honors are totally different entities in that honors is not emphasizing more work, uh, more busy work or anything. It's a very different type of interaction. Small classes with like-minded students and with like-minded faculty who step into the class with a, with a different oomph and set of expectation. But the curriculum may be the same. The textbook may be the same. It's just what happens in the class that's different. Lower division, in general, we have over 200 honors courses to choose from. Lots of different flavors, versions, upper division, lower division. But right now, what we call lower division, as I said, are not easy glasses. Differential equations is a lower division course. Um, organic chemistry is one. What honors students, even the ones with a lot of honors credits, have to do sometimes, a lot of times, is that they still need to take specific courses as requirements for their majors. And we have the whole depth and breadth of that. And I call it depth and breadth because it's not just the span, the, the, the uh, rainbow of courses from beautiful humanities all the way to all the, the, the STEM courses that you need in your further work, uh, you know, university work. But there, it's also the, as I said, it's not just the rainbow itself, it's the kinds of courses that are most likely to be needed or required or wanted by our students. Uh, we make very deliberate choices in that. We make sure that our students are offered or they give, they're given choices of courses that they actually want. But what's special about the the college at UCF, and I can vouch for it, I do this study every other year for the whole country, is the uniqueness of the upper division offerings. We are rare in the landscape of the honors education because we have over 70% of our population in STEM. And out of that, more than half is engineering and computer science. And why is that? It is because we have such a large uh, variety of upper division honors courses that come dovetailed with the honor students requirements for their majors. So in other words, we're trying to make it such that as you move along or up or whatever you want, the, you, you pick your, your imagery um, into your major, you have choices in honors that are not above and beyond or added on top of what you already have to take. And we focus on the STEM sequences because they're sequences. Um, in many, uh, many different types of majors, you have a lot of more choices right off the bat. You meet two or three prerequisites, you're good to go. STEM is not like that. A lot of the courses, a lot of the requirements go ladder like you have to take this before you can take that and then you have to take that and so because of that uh honors students because they have choices in upper division that are not necessarily great i mean um, uh, easy to find in other honors programs find it very easy to fulfill honors requirements at the same time as they do fulfill their college specific requirements so we have Lots of different things, mathematics, biology, engineering, all especially, I mean, the, 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 the ones where we have most uh, upper division work tend to be engineering, computer science, 
business and life sciences. And that's also the, the largest representation of honor students in our college. There, there's a special kind of honors course that's not tied or tethered or part of any specific major. And that is the epitome of honors education, I would call it. All honors, this is not a unique feature of our college, but all honors programs and colleges around the country um, try to foster and um, encourage some kind of interdisciplinarity. Uh, the future belongs to Renaissance people, people who can do more than one thing and think a little bit um, outside the norms and they can answer the dreaded question, tell me more about you in an interview. I joke a lot about this, but it's a very, very, very important truth that um, you have that edge, you have to show interest in things other than just the, a list of courses on your major. Of course, that's the number one, that's the baseline, it's, it's a must. But what do you do above and beyond? So interdisciplinarity shows um, a, a different mindset. Uh, it gives you access to letters of recommendation from people who think differently, who write differently. Uh, and it gives you serendipity, the way to find out truth about one field by looking at a different one. Um, we have an ever moving, changing list of seminars. You can find them on our website. I just picked a few that looked interesting, but just keep in mind seminars by definition are supposed to be fresh. And they're unique to the Honors College. Students who are not in the Honors College cannot enroll in those. And you have to take at least one of those. Guess what? Most honor students take way more than the minimum required of honors courses, uh, requirement of honors courses, and they take more seminars than one just because they're uh, extremely satisfying. Honor students come with multiple interests. Uh, they have a passion for music, for literature, even if they major in forensic science, and there's nothing wrong with marrying the two. Symposium is another one of those courses where you which you have to take without having uh, it meet specific requirements. It is a one credit hour pass fail course, so it's not onerous requirement or anything, but this is the time when we try to make a class, a family out of strangers. Our entering class has been remarkably stable in terms of numbers. We've been around 500 students forever. But we really, 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 really try those 500 students to kind of hit it from the first week of classes at UCF. And symposium is trying to accomplish that, of course, above and beyond or uh, complementary to the honors courses themselves, the like other courses. Um, these are some of the goals, but the, they're the most important elements that we think about when we talk symposium, an exposure to very interesting characters, people who dedicate, devote their lives to very interesting things, whether it's science or, or, or social whatever, or philosophy, it doesn't matter. It's people who, uh, and in my mind and other people's mind, this is a great connection between a major, a focus, a disciplinary focus and a life focus. Because you can major in all kinds of things and spend your life fighting for other things or working towards other things. So that's one of the, it's just a sampling because of course I can't list everything. Another part is, of course, the social aspect. We, we, every freshman is part of a small team with upperclassmen, team leader. You, are, you go to your team leaders for advice. They're also watching over you a little bit of like um, in loco parentis of sorts. They're hovering a little bit, but in a good way, much better than mom and dad or us. But that's the 
time when you kind of grow up a little bit with your team, with your peers and so with life in college. The other part of learning and, and college is what happens outside the classroom. Uh, and a large part of what's best in college is what we, we call discovery. We had to find a word for this, but whenever you try to, or you learn something with a question in mind, that was the advice I gave my students all my life. It's much better. You know it better, you understand it better, you internalize it better. So discovery is the time when you actually undertake the proposition of answering a question with, a, uh, with your question um, in some way or another. Of course, the more, uh, more or less formal undergraduate research is the best way to do that, or the easiest way to do that, I should say. And we have a whole office, Office, office of Honors Research, that promotes it through multiple, multiple, multiple venues. However, and I insist it, write it down, the Honors College at UCF does not require a thesis for everybody. And I do know that this is a feature of a lot of honors programs that may turn off some students or attract others. We have an option. We encourage students to do that, but we do not ask all the students to do that. The thesis is an option. And it's a great option. And if you want to go to law school, to medical school, and to uh, pursue a PhD program, if your dream is to be a professor like the one that teaches you Calc 1, uh, guess what? Uh, research is a must, and the thesis is the second best or uh, equally important. We have a track, and our students do amazing work. And what I love best about this, this is, um, you can find on, on uh, the UCF libraries, a place where our, you can see how students, how people from all over the world are actually downloaded students thesis. So this is just, well, I hope it works. Uh, it should, Actually, you can see it live on stars. My website doesn't like it. You can see how people live download theses from all over the world. And these are numbers that were not long ago. This is what your research is doing to the world. Isn't that cool? And not only that, but all the, um, the committees where you apply for whatever may be a PhD or a law degree or a medical school degree, they can see it themselves, read it themselves and see how popular or downloaded it is, how relevant it is. The third aspect of the honors pillars is, sorry, is um, engagement. What do we mean by that? Uh, you come to college with a lot of expectations about life in college. Uh, of course, you go to course to class, you take courses, you get good grades in them. You maybe do some research, hopefully, or at least think about it. But then there's a lot of other stuff that you sh should be doing or consider be to do. Uh, we have inside honors activities that, uh, and, uh, and organizations that we want you to consider. Uh, Honors Congress is the best of them. It is a student organization where you can become an officer as soon as, or as young as your freshman year, 18. Um, it's not just the leadership that you can, you know, achieve, but the fun activities that you, you can create. Every generation, every class brings new ideas. And of course, uh, we're moving into TikTok and Instagram, what, all of the above, because of course, that's what our students want. But they also share goodness of the heart and they try and they do a lot of activities to help others. And again, uh, Brandy and I joke a lot that we're too old to be invited to some of these things, but 
um, they happen. Even during the pandemic, I, I must tell you, some activities or quite a few activities did happen, whether in their morphed, changed version uh, of virtual this and that, but they do happen. So this is one way to, to get um, engaged, but there are many others. Uh, our students are all over the campus, all over the community. Uh, they're over totally overrepresented in the Order of Pegasus awardees. Uh, we this year are one of the top national Fulbright scholars, uh, producers in the United States, and the top one in the state of Florida. So it was too late to add it to the. That's why I don't like presentations as such. I like to. Um, I I wish I could have gotten all the pictures of all the ORDs. Uh, our students are doing amazing things, uh, even during times of the pandemic. We engage our students in all types of ways. Uh, we have weekly, monthly events on campus, in the building, in the garden nowadays, everything from Halloween to Freedom Pie Friday. Uh, the deans are walking around and chatting with everybody. It's a very open door kind of environment. The idea is that, as the Dean says, what's your plan is the question du jour. What's your plan? Oh, have you considered this? What are you thinking about this? Have you tried this? We have uh, platforms. I don't want to call them web courses because they're that sounds like horrible. There are places where you can join and learn about how to do a Zoom interview, of course, how to write a resume. And by the way, part of the symposium is join the LinkedIn account, write your resume or update your resume or learn all the stuff that you have to cleanse off of your resume as soon as you get in college. How do we help you do that? We have support in the building, in the, in, the, in the college that's above and beyond or transcending or, or complementary to all the advising that you get in your respective colleges. Uh, our Office of Honors Advising is two great honors alums, uh, winners of awards, who've been there, done that, and not only they know what's, what's what at UCF and in all kinds of different majors and areas, but not, and they lived your life, but they can answer questions that are more traumatic, like what do I do with my life? I hate my major, what do I do next kind of questions. And they do a great job at that. They, they will help you find the answer to your question with a wonderful result. Um, we have an Office of Honors Research, which helps you figure out, do I want to write a thesis? Or if I don't want to write a thesis, should I do research? And how can I find my research mentor? We have match days for research faculty from College of Engineering and Honors College and different colleges and Honors College, where that's exactly the idea to, to allow students to hear faculty talk about what they do and they love best. And then maybe, maybe, hopefully, and it happens a lot more than you think, um, have this match where the student joins the professor for a research group and continues on. Uh, we have an Office of Prestigious Awards, as I said, uh, my colleague Morgan and is working with students who want to be considered or at least learn about what are prestigious awards? How do you even think about applying for them? What do they give you? Um, and that's, it's a, it's a, it's a journey. It's not the kind of a, a company or a application that you can pull through the night before. I, I hope that those of you interested in applying to the Honors College will not do that, apply the night before. The earlier, the better, but that's exactly what the Office of Prestigious Awards is doing. 
uh, a lot of great, 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 brilliant students sometimes need a nudge to realize how great they are and why should they apply. We have a lot of internal scholarships that are great in, in themselves, but I also call them stepping stones for the bigger ones. And I have a say, riches beget riches, unfortunate or fortunate, whatever, which means that the more awards you, you win, the more award you will win. Uh, and every time you apply for things is, is, is a practice because applying is an art and a science. So there, monies to support your endeavors, whether it's study abroad, whether it's research, or just because you're great. And again, each of them requires an application, but they're not like 2,000 people applying for one thing kind of applications. They're not nothing like that. So it's a good um, incentive for you to keep going. I hate the word privilege, and I keep saying it again and again and again and again, but there's, I couldn't find any, anything in the source that replaced this word in an, any meaningful way. But there are things that come with being an honor student. One of the ones that students think about first is, of course, they register for classes early and for a year in advance, which is kind of cool. Why? We call it a a tool because that allows them to schedule that semester long internship or study abroad because they all their ducks are aligned in the right way. Um, the building itself is an oasis and a hub and it's a place where students can congregate, learn, study, um, feel at home, and that's how it's designed. Uh, there are many others. I'm not, again, I don't like to, to show that as much as the fact that the best benefit is just be with students like yourselves, with people who want to be talking with you all the time and whose name you know. And um, that's probably the best benefit. When you finish and you get the University Honors uh, uh, Medallion, and, and actually Honors in the Major is similar, we have lots of celebrations for you. And of course, the medallion is kind of cool, but what's important is what, what the students do. They accomplish a lot. Um, there's, I just, this is, what fits on a one slide, of course, the university list is much longer. They go to any place you've heard of and more. Um, the acceptance rate is pretty impressive anywhere. They serve, that's another point of pride. And they get jobs. If you have, if we have parents in the room here, uh, be happy, kids get jobs and, a lot of them get very, very, very good jobs. So there is hope <laughs> at the end of the tunnel as a mother of somebody, I can tell you. Um, and of course, a lot of you probably already know uh, how to apply for the Honors College. Uh, we have a website that answers all the questions. Uh, we have an online request for application form. Um, we're we have great uh, student assistants who can answer a lot of questions about that. And uh, these are just, the, that's my last slide. Um, these are some of the questions that we get a lot. We don't use cutoffs for admissions, but we're very, very competitive. Last year, the SAT for the admitted class, five, or it was larger than we wanted because of the unusual pandemic here. Uh, it was 1467, close to 33 ACT, 29 foreign languages spoken at home, which makes me very happy because I like foreign languages and I speak a few myself. Um, lots of valedictorians, etc. So um, this is the bottom line. We try to make sure that talents and gifts are uh, 
acknowledged and included in the Honors College. So I'm not going to answer questions about housing. Maybe at the end we can do some, but uh, I hope that this information should be enough for a further question. And I do not want Stacy to hate my life to be for being late. So yay. Okay. I will stop sharing if I can. Okay. Or share. No. Am I still sharing? Why can I do that? Am I still sharing? Yes, you are. What I can try to do is do that. If I can override it. Um, override it. I just it doesn't allow me. To, it looks like resume share. Stop share. Now it's here. Okay, sorry about this. There, I have too many things opened at the same time. Okay. Well, thank you for that uh, segue to Lead Scholars Academy. Uh, my name is Stacey Mallorett. I'm the director for Lead Scholars Academy. I have two students with me as well who will be co-presenting and giving you the student side of things with Lead Scholars Academy. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the presentation. And we are gonna start with a, a video about Lead Scholars Academy to kind of show you what a day in the life of Lead Scholars looks like. So just give me one second to do that. And so we're gonna see if this works here. Hello, and welcome to the Lead Scholars Academy. My name is Dr. Stacey Mallorette, and I serve as the director for the program. Lead Scholars Academy offers a two-year program for incoming first-year students that focuses on academics, leadership, and community service. The mission is to develop UCF's next generation of leaders. Hey, I'm Chris. I'm a second-year student here at UCF. Behind me is our Lead Lounge, where we have our Lead classes hosted every single week. Students are also able to come here 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. to either study or attend social events. Let's go check it out. Hi, I'm Maddie. And I'm Sean. In LEAD, there's always new opportunities to make friends, whether it's playing Wii on Wednesdays in the lounge, going to leadership retreats, tailgating, playing I Am Sports, or going to movie nights, there's always fun to be had. We also have a couple of large events too, like Family Weekend, Graduation, Formal, and Leadership Week. It's a great community to be a part of. Hi, my name is Sydney. And my name is Michaela. We're freshmen currently living in the Lead Scholars Living and Learning community. Neptune's a great place to live because it's the newest dorm on campus, you get your own private bedroom, and only have to share a bathroom with one other person. It's close to the pool, gym, and dining hall, and we get to live with all of our friends in LEAD. It also helps with our studies because we're constantly surrounded by people who are just as passionate about class and LEAD. Hi, I'm Hershey and I'm a second year LEAD Scholar. Something unique about our program is that it's designed to promote leadership across campus and beyond. You can find LEAD Scholars involved in all aspects on campus. I'm Nicole and I'm a member of Alpha Delta Pi Sorority. I'm Ross, I'm in Ultimate Frisbee. Hi, I'm Akila, and I'm the movie night director for UCS Homecoming. Hi, I'm Danielle and I'm in the Honors College. I'm Avery, I'm a resident assistant. I'm Cassie, I'm in ROTC. Hi, I'm Jess Martell, and I'm a member of the Pre-Professional Medical Society. And I'm a lead scholar. And I'm a lead scholar. And I'm a lead scholar. Hello, my name is Dr. Jermaine Graham, and I am the Associate Director of the Lead Scholars Academy. If you are an incoming freshman with a passion for service and helping your community, we hope that you will apply to our program. Please visit us at lead.ses.ucf.edu. We look forward to reviewing your application. Hope to see you soon. Okay, 
So I'm hoping that that gave you a better insight into what Lead Scholars is all about. Okay, and I'm gonna let now um, Ben and Abby introduce themselves and get started with a um, couple more slides. Awesome, so my name is Abigail Price and I am also part of the Lead Scholars in one of the student leadership positions as the LEB Executive Director. And so you see that here we have Dr. Mallory, which she did just present, Dr. Graham and Dr. Torres. And these are our head staff and they're super awesome to work with. Then we also have some graduate assistants that uh, student leaders get to work really, really closely with. And we learn about how, how their undergrad went and also learn how what their leadership is all about as well. So those are some familiar faces that you will see um, once you get into the program. Okay, so I'm gonna share some quick facts about Lead Scholars Academy um, and um, some more of the academics before Ben talks about some of the leadership um, aspects of the program. So we have students who major in all sorts of different things across campus. Our top three, uh, biomedical sciences, psychology and health sciences. But I like to say that we have students who are majoring across the board because leadership is going to help you out. Um, regardless of what field you go into, it's going to all is going to always help you get to that next level. So we have students majoring in A to Z. So last year's cohort, we had 303 incoming freshmen. Uh, we look at applications on a rolling basis. You can see some of our averages for um, SAT and ACT and high school GPA on there as well. We're also a very diverse program with um, our ethnic minority enrollments, 52.8%. Um, about 12% of this year's cohort are also in the Burnett Honors College, ranges between 10 and 20% every year, depending on the year. Um, some of the things I'm really happy and um, about and proud of are our student success measures. Our retention rate, which means that our freshmen become sophomores, is about 96%. And then our four-year graduation rate is um, about 65%, both which are much higher than the average UCF student. Um, all sorts of different accolades on here I can speak about as well. We do almost 20,000 service hours a year, so we really are part of the bigger community. So one aspect of our program is the academic aspect. All of our students take a two credit hour leadership course every semester that they are in the program for four semesters. Uh, we study the social change model of leadership. I tell students in the introduction to leadership class, you are going to find yourself in who you are as a leader. It's like backpacking across Europe, but a lot cheaper. So you get to know who you are as a leader. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What is your philosophy of leadership? Um, what are the skills that I am um, best at? And how does that relate to my future major? So it's a lot of fun too. All of our classes are capped at 26 students and they have a peer mentor in that first semester as well to help that transition from high school to college. Some other benefits, we offer a $200 fellowship every semester that a student is in good standing, priority class registration, that lead lounge, which you saw in the video, all sorts of endowed scholarships just for lead scholars and an optional living learning community, which we'll get into in just a little bit. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Ben to talk about that living learning community. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Ben Willett. I am a second year lead scholar here. I am also a part of the leadership board uh, for the Leadership Excellence Board, like Abigail Perez. Uh, she is the executive director and I am the open house director. I am currently majoring in statistics with a minor in IT. So let's get into the living and learning community. It is in Neptune 157, which are the newest residence halls on campus. It is an individual suite style living. So that means you get your own room, which is absolutely amazing as an incoming freshman to college. You definitely need your own little safe space at the end of the day to go and relax to. Plus you only have to share a bathroom with one other person. Also, we have a very large common room on each floor for the Lead Scholars and the LLC in Neptune, which features a study space, TV, and a fully equipped kitchen, which is really awesome to make food on campus. And then it's also a central location, which is very close to the gym, the pool, the IM fields, and of course the lead lounge, 
and a, another cafeteria, uh, 63 South, which it's close to everything and it's really awesome. Personally, I wasn't in it my uh, first year just because I applied a little late, but I really wish I was just because I was over there constantly with my friends, just hanging out, uh, getting some studying done, whatever was necessary. And it was a really enjoyable experience. So moving forward from the LLC. And those applications are open right now in housing. Absolutely. So we also have exclusive lead events and activities. I do want to preference uh, a lot of this did not happen. Uh, of course, due to the unforeseen circumstances due to COVID, but uh, we're hopeful that in the uh, coming months and in the next year, we will have Real Retreat, which is a two-day event where lead scholars will go essentially camping, uh, glamping, if you will, in a, log in a uh, cabin scenario, just learning all about lead scholars and introduction to lead scholars, and just meeting all of your cohort for the first time uh, within the Lead Scholars Academy. We have interest-based committees. So I am the open house director and I have a committee. Normally in a normal setting, I would have a committee that would help me do open house uh, with different students to get out there uh, as first years with the leadership opportunities. We also normally have tailgates when the football team is around, which is a great atmosphere. If you love UCF, you're gonna love our UCF football program, just no matter what, it's gonna be amazing. Uh, we also have lead lounge socials uh, that was moved pretty much all online this year, and it was still a wonderful time. It can be as simple as listening to music uh, with other people or chatting about the last week. It's something as simple as that. We also have snacks. Snacks with Stacy is one of the big ones that happens where we talk about everything that's going on with the month uh, with Dr. Mallorette. We also have the family weekend activities, which is a Normally the first time you get to see your parents again after transitioning into college for the first time. So it's really good to see them, see how you're keeping up, see if you've been shaving well enough. So <laughs> keeping with that, we also have lead formal. Lead formal is basically a prom. It's a fun little get together to have a great time. We also uh, crown a king and queen uh, for lead formal as well. So that's awesome. And we also do graduation for the second year lead scholars that are moving on to greater things. So moving forward with that. So enacting leadership, you, it is the Lead Scholars Academy of, of course, so we have leadership experience that you guys can have in your first two years as in college. So for the full year, we have director level positions. This is going to be second year uh, level positions. We have the Leadership Excellence Board or the Lead Student Association. The difference between the two is the Leadership Excellence Board, which is myself, uh, Abigail and a couple, <laughs> a couple other people within LEB, we are more towards outreach, getting people to understand what Lead Scholars is all about and recruitment as well. We also go to high schools, middle schools, and learn about to teach about leadership and all that fun stuff. The Lead Students Association is more about dealing with the people inside of Lead Scholars. Those are the people that are going to host socials for people that are already in Lead Scholars. Uh, that are first years to get that good college experience within the Lead Scholars Academy. We also have semester long positions, which are the peer mentors that uh, Dr. Mallory had mentioned for your first year Lead Scholars classes. Those peer mentors are there for your first semester to basically show you and give you the ability to learn about what UCF is all about from an experienced person uh, within their second year and to also help with that transitional phase because college is very difficult to transition into and everybody needs help at some point. So they're just there to help you even guide along in the smallest of things. We also have short-term leadership positions where we have real counselors, which will help out during real retreat to uh, basically gather a group of uh, first years to basically enjoy each other's presence and have a fun time for the two days. And we also have that's exactly what it is, the real counselors. So with those second year students, they have leadership, but we also have leadership for first year students to uh, help out with as well. So next slide. We also, of course, have first year leadership. Even in your first semester in college, you can still get involved in leadership positions. We have assistant director positions that can help out either present for open house to there are multiple different committees that you are able to join. There's an athletics committee. If you like athletics and you like hosting uh, sports related events, we have socials committees. 
which are in charge of doing like small little things around the lead lounge, whether it be cahoots, whether it be listening to music, whether it be talking. It's good ways to get involved to uh, basically get your name out there to if you are looking to get a director position in the future. We also have the student advisory board, which is something in your second semester as a first year. And what that is, is you're going to basically be the peer mentor for that second semester. So you're going to fill everybody in on upcoming events for lead scholars and all that, just so that the first years have an opportunity to get some sort of leadership. And there's also committee participation. Even if you're not an assistant director, those, that participation really comes in handy if you want a leadership position within your future at UCF. Okay, so um, LEAD scholars have done some great things across campus as well. Um, about half of the Presence Leadership Council, which is the highest leadership position you can have, um, this group of 35 students who serve as the ambassadors for the Presence Office or LEAD scholars, um, Order of Pegasus. We don't do quite as good as honors, but we do pretty good uh, with the number of students who uh, receive the Order of Pegasus, which is kind of like UCF's Hall of Fame for students. And then, you know, service hours, we just do so many um, hours to help our um, local and Florida community. All right, so now you know all about LEAD and I'm gonna turn it up over to see how you can apply. Yes, so now you received all of this awesome information and you're like, wow, this is a great program and I definitely want to apply because that's what I did. <laughs> and so these are the five things that you'll need. And the fifth one is optional as you see. So you'll need a resume, you'll complete an essay response to one of the proctored questions that we will provide to you. Then you will complete either a project and this project can be a PowerPoint video on something that you've done that has affected your community in a great way. Um, and if you feel like maybe you don't wanna do PowerPoint or video, you're more than welcome to do an essay response. Then once you submit all of this information and the letter of recommendation, if you would like, you would then complete a phone interview, which is conducted by some of the students and staff here at Lead Scholars, um, where we ask some really awesome questions to kind of get to know you um, and different things like that. So you'll see the website right there. You can apply on the website. And also, if you have further questions after the Q&A, feel free to follow us on Instagram because yes, that's where we'll have some more information too. Okay. Yeah. So uh, by the way, go, I would go back real quick. If you want to follow us on Instagram or Facebook, you're more than welcome to do so. We are there at, at lead UCF for Instagram and for Facebook, UCF Lead Scholars Academy. I know we are very big on Instagram when it comes to getting up-to-date information out there, as well as what's going on within Lead Scholars Academy. So give us a follow if you are interested and in continuing the support for this year and forward. So any questions, comments, and concerns at the end, uh, there is a little Google form that you are able to submit if your question isn't necessarily answered, or if you have any other concerns, you wanna know how we, how you wanna ask us how we did or let us know how we did, uh, please fill out this Google form. I will send it in the chat as a link. So if you wanna click on that at the end of the Q&A, you are more than welcome to do so and fill it out. Uh, it just requires your name, your email, and then it'll go through asking you any questions if you have them. So with that, I guess we are good to open up the Q&A. Yes, thank you all so much for uh, your presentations on the Burnett Honors College and LEAD Scholars. We've received quite a few questions for both of uh, these programs, so I will go ahead and get these up. Um, for those of you joining us, if you have any questions, uh, please put those in the Q&A and we will get those to our group. So first question is going to be for both areas. How does involvement in the Honors College and or leads, uh, the LEAD program affect student social life? Well, with the Burnett Honors College, we offer a lot of social activities for our students to engage in. Um, as we mentioned, Honors Congress is a very active student organization. We also have... Um, say events with the deans. Currently we have weekly events with the deans, um, like kicking it with the koi, where you can hang out in our meditation garden by the koi pond and chat with our deans. And we have monthly um, activities based on holidays. So we do have some social activities. We may not be quite as social as lead scholars, but we do have a lot of those for our students as well. 
and I would say from talking to students, I'll let Ben or Abby correct me if I'm wrong, but the one, the best benefit, which is a un, not, not a tangible benefit, I think with lead scholars is people make their best friends in lead scholars. I've had students that have bridesmaids and I've seen 12 marriages in lead scholars. So they are connecting, you know, so they're making connections with like-minded people and building good, healthy relationships and becoming a part of something bigger than themselves. Thank you. Uh, so question for lead. If a student is isn't 100% sure what they want to major in, um, they already have a major in mind, would lead be a place that would be a good fit for, a good fit for them, excuse me? Um, if so, would the academy help them find their passion? Yeah, well, I think in the introduction class, you get to find out who you are as a student. We do all sorts of different leadership assessments, like True Colors, Myers-Briggs, Quest. You get to find a little bit more about who you are and what your passion is. And we do have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with um, the faculty member for every LDR 2001 student where they are going to go over exactly that. What's your major? Have you registered for classes next semester? What do you want to do when you graduate? And so they're going to have that relationship and that faculty member will be able to point them into resources if necessary um, to help them maybe with career services or you know different advising offices. But I think getting to know who you are is the first step of knowing what you want to major in. I can personally attest to that just because I did start off as a nursing major when I first started college and I took the Lead Scholars Academy and it was through like really actually it was through those personality quizzes and the Myers-Briggs that I was like wow okay maybe this isn't really where I was supposed to be and now I'm an education major so. Awesome thank you. Now for honors is it possible for non-honor students to take part in honors courses? Generally, no, because our university honors courses are set aside for university honors students who need them to meet their university honors requirements to graduate with honors. It mm -hmm. is a very rare occasion where as if we have a uh, typically under enrolled class, maybe, but in general, the rule is no honors students. For honors. It's not the, an under, sorry, it's not the under enrolled class because we have a lot of classes that are under enrolled. It has to be with the strict uh, specific recommendation of a particular faculty uh, who may want this particular student who is majoring in XYZ to sit in an honors course if it's possible at all. Very, very so, rare. Very rare, yeah. Sorry. Now, what kind of overlap is there between the honors college and lead scholars? Well, as Dr. Mallory mentioned, we have, you know, about 30 to 40 students each year who are both university honors and lead scholars. So obviously there's a good amount of overlap. With the honor symposium course, there is some built-in extracurricular activity. Students are required to, um, you know, attend events and things like that as part of symposium. And from my understanding, they're generally allowed to use those for their lead scholars service requirements. So you can kind of double dip a little bit in that area. Uh, we do have we we encourage engagement of our students in any form shape and color and leads is a great partner um, we uh, our students tend to be engaged in many ways uh, via leads or other uh, student organizations uh, so the overlap is i call it a cognate it helps to uh, develop all kinds of skills. Uh, some of them can be developed within the Honors College, but some of them benefit a lot from uh, involvement with leads. Uh, in, in terms of requirements and curriculum, there's not a lot of overlap, but uh, as Brandy said, there are some activities that could be uh, construed as beneficial for both. So, um, yeah, both programs uh, encourage retention and involvement and engagement and participation. So in that, we're like cousins or like siblings of sorts, but uh, the focus is slightly different. In the Honors College, you can be, uh, the requirements are such that you can be not involved at all if you choose to, although that would be heartbreaking and still graduate with university honors uh, if you meet certain curriculum requirements. 
but that's rare. The majority of our honor students are also very involved with the campus and activities and so forth. So that's where the overlap is. And after a student applies for LEAD scholars, when do they typically hear their decision about getting into the program? So after the phone interview, they will hear um, back via email about the decision within two weeks. Okay. And Sometimes what about- Maybe three if it's like right at the deadline, so it takes us a longer time to review everything. Gotcha. And then what about with honors? When do our, the honors applicants typically hear a decision about the honors college? Basically just hit it. <laughs> right now, it's really pretty good. The fast uh, turnaround, the closer you get to the deadline. Uh, keep in mind, we received a lot of up, over 1,100 applications so far. We admit everybody who we think has a, is a good likely to be successful on our student. Uh, but then it's first come first serve in terms of reservation, the seat reservation, seat uh, commitment. Um, but yes, we're trying to do it as soon as we can. Don't wait until the last minute because then it will take longer. Like Stacy said, if we get 400 applications in like a week, uh, yeah. <laughs> If a student is both honors and lead, which living learning community should they live in? Do you have any recommendations? Abigail, you look like you might have an answer. <laughs> I think it really just- I, Yeah, the lead. I say lead. <laughs> just because, I mean, I'm obviously biased, but I did meet some of my best friends in the lead lab and like the lead living learning community. Um, and she was one of my bridesmaids in my wedding. And so, you know, definitely biased, but lead all the way. <laughs> I really think it has to do with what your, your desired living, uh, what your plans are, what your budget fits, um, mm -hmm. because with the towers, it is a year round contract. So you're sending up for fall, spring and summer, the upside, you don't have to move your stuff as often. The downside, it is a more expensive contract. And so really we encourage our students in the honors college to pick the living arrangement that fits their budget and fits their lifestyle because housing is such a personal decision, we're not gonna tell you where you have to live. Since I'm the older one around and I have a kid who went to college already finished and everything, I always say housing is good in the eye of the beholder. We have honor students in all kinds of communities. Uh, the honors community leads all kinds. And what I do know is that housing is trying to match honor students with honor students wherever possible and whenever possible. All housing at UCF is good. It, there's not like a Ritz versus model, model six or some kind of damp, like crappy <laughs> housing. They're all good. It's a matter of lifestyle choice. And as I said, it's good in the eye of the beholder. So um, I wouldn't, I never say, oh my God, you should go there because it's hard to tell. Um, and again, uh, whichever choice you do, make most out of it. I mean, if you prefer like Claire, good for you. If you prefer academic villages, good for you. It's, it's not so much the housing itself as much as what you do when you're there. Just my two cents, sorry about this. And let me add to that, we do host honors events in Tower 3 for honors students, but you can attend them even if you don't live there. So all honors students are invited to the events in honors Tower 3, um, and I would assume similar for lead scholars as well. Thank you, that was actually one of our questions that came in. So thank you for uh, answering that. Uh, so I have one more question um, that we have time for, um, for our LEAD program. Um, we have received a couple questions about this. Are students able to be a part of LEAD and Compass and Excel um, and honors? Um, mainly they were asking about Excel, Compass and LEAD. Yeah, definitely, Excel. we have several students in Excel and Compass. Okay, perfect. I also wanna preface something that uh, you are also able to participate in other extracurriculars on campus. Uh, there is a lot of time if you are able to organize your time correctly, you are able to do a lot more on campus. I'm a student athlete on campus. I'm a part of the American Society of Civil Engineers on campus. I am also part of LEAD. 
So there is so much you can do. It just matters on your time commitment. It matters on your organizational uh, skills. So, but you are definitely able to participate in other programs as well as other extracurriculars. Same with honors. We had a football player as well, and that was pretty amazing. So <laughs> I just wanted to mention something about Excel and Compass and honors. I know I'm friends with people who run these programs. Uh, they would rather not, they, they don't encourage students to do all of them, honors and all or any Excel or Compass because a lot of what Excel and Compass does is the cohorting and uh, creating the small environment for certain types of courses, which honor students already have. And they say, if you can have that, you don't need both. It's not that they come in conflict with each other, but they're not necessarily helping each other. Um, and I, I know that they say, well, it's better to choose one or the other if you have the choice. So um, I'm not saying you shouldn't consider both. I'm just saying that at some point they may, one of us may encourage you to consider one or the other because the paradigm is the same. I'm actually, I helped write the proposal for the Excel proposal to National Science Foundation and it was modeled after the Honors College at the time, which means small courses with students who know each other and kind of move along together. And that's part of the ingredient of the main ingredient. So again, my, my friend in the, in the Excel program would uh, like be happy to hear me say that uh, because they want to kind of make sure that students don't necessarily try everything at the same time, especially for these two, the two kinds of things. Just the thought. Again, it's not a rule. You can participate in both. There's, we have students who do that, but it's not necessarily um, twice as helpful, if I may say that. All right, well, thank you all uh, for joining us today for our um, Burnett Honors College and our Lead Scholars presentation. Um, thank you panelists um, for doing your presentations and students for joining us as well. Uh, we are going to move into our parent and student panel starting at seven o'clock. So parents, you can stay put. Students, we are going to move over to the YouTube Live and Facebook Live uh, to answer our uh, questions for our students. Uh, so if you'd like to stick around, we will start the parent and student panel in just a few moments. But thank you all so much for joining us. And again, thank you panelists um, and presenters. Thank you for having us. Thank you.